Yes, yes, we, we can hear you uh, very okay. well. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Gerardo Schoel uh, from Georgia State University, and uh, he will talk about uh, sub-epidemic ensemble models for the forecasting of uh, infectious disease. Uh, Thank you very please much. go ahead. Thank you for inviting me. I think there are some interesting connections to the pre previous talk, so um, I'm glad about that. Um, so this is uh, an evolving story. We have been uh, working on developing subepidemic models over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, in fact, we started uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, and I will present uh, you know, some of the motivation for that and some of the most recent work we have been doing in, in this direction. So first of all, uh, this is the SIR model that I'm um, sure most of you, if not all of you, uh, know well. And I just would like to stress the, the fact that uh, the main assumption here is that the population is well mixed, individuals are uh, well connected to each other. And as a result, in a susceptible population, you expect exponential growth, which is a very strong assumption to make. Uh, and depending on the setting, depending on the type of disease, it may not be the best assumption. Um, these models can be expanded to include other characteristics, other uh, population groups, such as you know, hospitals, and to model transmission from hospitals when infection control protocols are not great, or to model, for instance, in the case of Ebola, we can include a funeral class to account for transmission uh, from um, and during funeral events. Uh, this is to say that uh, there are some events that are not synchronous, right, all the time in this type of models and uh, are not necessarily well captured uh, by compartmental models because transmission within hospitals, nosocomial outbreaks or outbreaks stemming from, from funerals do not occur on a continuous basis, but they are events that may occur once in a while during the trajectory, during the course of the epidemic. And it's very difficult to actually capture that asynchronicity in transmission. So that I think that's one of the challenges with these models and on an interesting venue for uh, pure for the research. So uh, as I said, and with this type of models, when we have you know, susceptible populations, large susceptible populations, we expect exponential growth. And as a result, uh, you know, predictions will also follow exponential growth dynamics, which may not be necessarily uh, the case for every single infectious disease outbreak. In fact, for Ebola and other infectious diseases that are not transmitted through the air, by, are, are driven by close contact, we have seen more uh, slower spread, more in the line of uh, polynomial growth patterns. And in, in reality, epidemics exhibit variable epidemic growth dynamics. Um, so polynomial growth dynamics and this type of early growth trajectories could be influenced by multiple factors, difficult to disentangle from one single epidemic curve. Um, we, it could be uh, influenced by behavior changes, by spatial effects, uh, clustering in contact networks, heterogeneities that we may not know that exist and that are relevant in the spread, particularly when we are dealing with newly emerging infectious diseases. Uh, the textbook example of polynomial growth is the HIV epidemic. And in particular, in the United States, uh, there's uh, data documenting um, polynomial growth, subexponential growth, even when we stratify the data according to geographic regions or by ethnic groups, we see that the epidemic follow a, a cubic polynomial in cumulative case counts. And this was uh, reported um, back in the, in the 80s by the group uh, in Los Alamos, uh, Colgate, at all and others. <clears throat> and for Ebola, it's also another very interesting example where we saw, we have seen that the epidemic didn't really follow exponential growth dynamics. Maybe in some areas uh, like Montserrat in Liberia, Liberia, there was some, some exponential growth dynamics, but overall, this um, epidemic can be characterized by the aggregation of smaller subepidemics that follow subexponential growth. And as you can see, the epidemics are not occurring at the same time, but are occurring at very different times during the course of the epidemic. And when we aggregate the subepidemics, we see something like a wave that is spreading um, 
through the population. And this is uh, the transmission tree that was reconstructed for, from epidemiological data for the very early transmission dynamics of the 2014-15 Ebola epidemic in West Africa, where we can see that you know, most of the transmission events were occurring among caretakers at home or in healthcare settings, uh, indicating that airborne spread in you know, public settings was not happening uh, very often and indicating you know, the, the fact that Ebola is mostly transmitted through close contact, through an intimate contact, and supporting the slower spread uh, type of dynamic that, that we are seeing. So how do we characterize these early growth dynamics? So we have been working with uh, simple phenomenological models to characterize this early spread, uh, to measure and, and quantify that growth scaling that we call which is measured through the parameter P. So P less than one indicates sub-exponential growth. P equals one. Then we recover the Malthus equation that's exponential growth. And we are able to estimate two parameters. From one growth trajectory, it's possible to estimate two parameters. Um, and we can, uh, we can also quantify also the uncertainty, assuming a particular error structure, whether that is Poisson distribution, Poisson error structure, or something with some of their dispersion using negative binomial distribution, for instance. So we uh, went ahead and started to characterize some of the early growth patterns for across different infectious disease outbreaks from Ebola to flu um, back uh, a few years ago. And what we saw is uh, perhaps not surprising that uh, there's a lot of variability in, this, in these patterns, but clearly, um, the Ebola epidemics were following sub-exponential growth, a lot of variability. Difficult to understand what factors exactly are playing a role, but it's most likely a combination. But it's more important to recognize, right, that we have this type of scaling and that as a result, we need to use models that provide consistent dynamics in order to uh, fit the models and generate uh, more accurate uh, forecasts. Also, when we have sub-exponential growth dynamics, the definition of R0 uh, in a way breaks down, but it's not as, as bad as, as, as it sounds. It just means that the, the basic reproduction number or the reproduction number is not constant during the early phase, but actually declines asymptotically towards one, towards the epidemic threshold, and we have shown that. And that is in contrast, right, to the constant invariant uh, reproduction number that we expect during an early exponential growth uh, under which uh, you know, the basic mathematical theory of epidemics is, is built on. Here's an example uh, applying the generalized growth model to um, an Ebola epidemic in Western area, urban Sierra Leone, where you can see that clearly the value of P is around 0.5, indicating that the epidemic was growing roughly linearly with a p equals 0.5. And as a result, also the reproduction number tends to decline over time because of the sub-exponential growth property. And you can see when we used um, the first six weeks of our weeks, R was 1.3. But once we have data all the way um, for another 10 more weeks, the reproduction number declined a bit to 1.2 which is consistent with uh, what we expect for, for the dynamic. So how can we recover this type of uh, um, a lower than exponential growth dynamics? Well, there are many types of mechanisms from behavior changes, right? Changes in transmission rates, but also a spatial structure is very important. Here's just a, an illustration um, of a household community model put forward by Maria Kiskowski. And then uh, uh, I actually worked with her during the Ebola epidemic, where there are two layers of mixing within households and within communities. So there is a reproduction number within a household and a reproduction number within a community. And the communities are overlapping with each other, right? So we need two parameters. We need the size also of the household in terms of how many individuals are there. That's a column. And we need uh, the size of the community. So how many columns make up one community? And so here's a typical simulation um, 
with a relatively low community size. Uh, I think this was uh, community size was around uh, 15 or 20 households. You see how the epidemic spreads, right? In the form of a wave, which is consistent with what we are seeing with Ebola, at least qualitatively. And with these simulations, we can actually show that the sub-exponential growth pattern um, exists, can be recovered from this type of model with a constrained spatial structure. The solid um, black line is the exponential growth, and this, this exponential growth used to contrast with that. And C corresponds to the community size. So as we increase the community size, we expect faster and faster epidemic growth scaling. So P in a way is getting closer to one, right? So if, if C, the community size becomes, uh, is equals the size of the population, the total number of households in the population, then we can recover exponential growth. Now, if we move beyond the early scaling, the early dynamics of epidemics, we also need to think about how multiple subepidemics or epidemics, when they are aggregated with each other, give rise to uh, different um, epidemiological patterns and epidemic trajectories. And as you can see here, this is an epidemic um, with um, three modes, as you can see, that could be the result of transmission occurring as a result of um, different mechanisms. Maybe there's transmission in high risk groups and then transmission cascades into lower transmission groups, giving rise to other subepidemics. Or maybe we have transmission in one spatial unit and then um, there is a delay and then you have another uh, outbreak occurring in another spatial unit. So when you aggregate the incidence curve from both units, you see these different modes in the epidemic curve. And of course, uh, something that is very in fashion, the emergence of new variants. We, have, we can be having a spread, sustained spread from a, um, a virus like SARS-CoV-2, and then suddenly we have a new variant uh, with higher transmissibility, and uh, we can see uh, suddenly a new rise, a new resurgence in disease associated with the presence of, of new variants or maybe also behavior changes. So how do we accommodate those asynchronous uh, dynamics into the epidemics? It's a challenging problem. Here is another example with the, the 2018 Ebola epidemic where you can see multiple modes of transmission in different areas in, in Congo. And these modes were uh, really driven by, by violent events occurring uh, attacks against the healthcare settings, healthcare workers uh, that, um, that hampered the, the cont control of Ebola in, in Congo. So on the left, I wanted to show you three different transmission trees that can give rise to the same epidemic trajectory, right? So in a way, what I wanna say here is that it's very difficult to observe exactly what's happening, right? We are always dealing with uh, aggregated data, aggregated trajectories, epidemic trajectories. We are trying to estimate reproduction numbers from aggregated data. Uh, when in fact the reproduction number, ideally you would want to know who is infecting whom in order to generate accurate um, estimate, reliable estimates, but we have to deal with this, um, with the data that is available, the fact that we don't observe everything. And, and so on the right, you have the 2003 SARS outbreak in Singapore, uh, where you can see that the transmission was driven um, by transmission in two different healthcare settings, so multiple healthcare settings. The first wave here you can see, was actually the, driven by transmission in one healthcare setting. And then the next wave, the next mode of transmission was driven by the, in, in, in other healthcare settings. So there was a delay and then movement of patients and healthcare workers among different healthcare settings ignited the second mode, the second sub-epidemic. So how can we model these dynamics here? And so we have started to make some progress in this direction, at least using uh, phenomenological uh, growth models. The building block for the framework that uh, we have been working on is the generalized logistic growth model. So it's basic, basically an extension of the 
logistic growth model, where you can see um, that R is the growth rate, P is the scaling of growth, uh, that the same parameters that I, I showed you earlier with the generalized growth model, which is basically this section of the model. And then this additional section uh, models the saturation towards epidemic size. So the epidemic size here is represented by parameter K. And by doing this, we can model subepidemics or epidemics with different early growth dynamics, with different uh, scaling. This is with P equals 1.0. This is with P 0.92. You see that there is substantial difference, even if we vary slightly a little bit the scaling of growth parameter, right? This is 0.86. And so this gives us flexibility, more flexibility in order to capture the subepidemics, the underlying growth dynamics that, is, that are occurring within the epidemic waves. So this is the, the overlapping subepidemic wave model equations. Uh, basically, we model a set of subepidemics uh, in, this, in this framework. C of i corresponds to the community number of cases in, um, sub for subepidemic i. And then um, this parameter here, a sub i minus one, is just a, um, an indicator variable. Whenever the cumulative number of cases reaches a threshold, the next subepidemic takes off, as you can see here in this graph. So we have the first subepidemic, and then the next subepidemic takes off, that's in blue, and then the next subepidemic may take off, and that's in green. And the, the, I think the powerful part of this model is that we don't require a large number of parameters I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we don't require a large number of parameters to capture the epidemic wave. We just need up to five parameters. And that is independent of the number of uh, subepidemics. Now I have to tell you about the epidemic size. So the subepidemics actually decline because of interventions or behavior changes um, in a, an exponential fashion, like, like so. But it could also decline following a power law form. So there are, you know, there's flexibility also in the way we model how the size of the subepidemics, um, sequential subepidemics, uh, decline. The nice thing about this is that this, the, for this function, the actual size of the total epidemic wave has a closed form solution, which is here. So we don't have to just knowing how many subepidemics the Q parameter that regulates the, the interventions and the size of the initial subepidemic is sufficient to, to estimate the epidemic wave size. And as I said, the number of, num the number of model parameters is three if we have one subepidemic, but if we have more than one subepidemics, the number of parameters is fixed to five parameters. And that is R, P, the initial size of the subepidemics, the, the Q parameter that regulates interventions, the effect of interventions or behavior changes, and the threshold CTHR, right, that I showed you in the previous slide, that indicates when the next subepidemic will take off. And that is a fixed, fixed parameter as well. So in this slide, I show you some of the epidemic profiles uh, that you, we can obtain with this framework. You know, the first one is just a steady traveling wave. That is the result of aggregating subepidemics that, that are about the same size, but are, that are strongly overlapping. And then you have things like the third panel where the subepidemic sizes decline, and therefore you have one wave with a long tail. Or maybe the subepidemics are not as strongly overlapping, but are weakly overlapping, and as a result, we can see the modes, right, the peaks, multiple peaks, from the aggregated uh, red curve, as you can see here. So how do we estimate the uh, parameters and connect this with actual data? One of the most flexible ways uh, to do this is through parametric bootstrapping. Basically, it, we could be using a maximum likelihood framework to estimate the parameters. And then through parametric bootstrapping, assuming a, a specific error structure 
whether that is Poisson or something like negative binomial uh, distribution for over dispersion. We resample the best fit and de uh, derive uncertainty of the parameters. And at the same time, by doing that, we can obtain the uncertainty surrounding the best fit of the, of the data to the data. And uh, that uncertainty can be used to generate also the forecasts ahead. There are different ways to assess uh, how well the models are performing. I think uh, we are, uh, you know, the forecasting community in the, in the field is, for, is converging towards a set of metrics that are useful to assess performance. And that is the mean absolute error, the mean squared error, uh, the coverage of the 95% prediction interval, right? So how, man, how many of the data points into the future actually are covered within your prediction interval? And also the mean interval score, which is a more sophisticated version of the prediction interval because it accounts, penalizes for uh, prediction intervals that may be too wide or maybe too narrow and accounts for how far away the data points are to the lower bound and the upper bound of the 95% prediction interval. So here's one example. The very first example is the, the fit and forecast to the epidemic in Guangdong, China, where we only need one single subepidemic, right? We don't need to invoke uh, multiple subepidemics. So the model is fitted to the early part prior to the dash, uh, vertical dash line. And then the forecast is here, where you can see. Uh, I am also showing you the histograms of the uncertainty associated with the parameters obtained through the bootstrapping project process. The parameter R, the parameter P, right? Which is very close to one, indicating almost uh, exponential growth there uh, for COVID-19 in Guangdong. And then this is the estimate for the parameter, uh, for the size of the subepidemic, right? Um, and actually in this forecast, you can see the, the, the forecast is, pr is pretty good. Now let's move forward with the most interesting cases. Let's try to explain the 2003 SARS outbreak in Singapore with, which as I showed you earlier, is characterized by two subepidemics. It is nice to see that the framework is able to capture these two sub-epidemics. You can see this is the actual fit, and this figure is showing the profile of the sub-epidemics. So in red, the first one, in blue, the second one. And this shows the residuals uh, obtained by the difference of the data to the, the mean fit. This has the parameter estimates. Q is very small, indicating uh, that there was a very small change relative to the first epidemic. And the other parameters that you can see here, judging from the 95% confidence intervals is, uh, are pretty well obtained. Um, and uh, there's no issue of parameter identifiability. Uh, and in particular, I mentioned parameter identifiability because um, Sometimes it's difficult to detect if you have, we have a, an issue of parameter identifiability when we are dealing with models with multiple parameters. And um, when we are dealing with Bayesian frameworks with all of these priors, uh, it's difficult to tell if a parameter is not identified or not. But with this frequentist framework, it is easy to see just by looking at the uncertainty in the parameter if you have an issue uh, related to parameter identifiability. Here's another example of the, uh, a fit to the plague epidemic in Madagascar. We just fitted the model to this, the main wave here, and this is the fit. What you see is that the wave, the epidemic, the best fit is a subepidemic wave where the subepidemics are strongly overlapping with each other, right? And by the way, all of these curves in red correspond to the multiple curves obtained from the bootstrapping process. I don't think I had mentioned that. And uh, we need just four subepidemics to in order to characterize this epidemic wave. 
Now we can use this to generate short-term forecasts. And I think this is an, a nice example where you see, um, by the way, prior to the vertical line, again, is the calibration period. After the vertical line, we have four week ahead forecasts. Different colors are different subepidemics. What you see here is that by accounting for those subepidemics that are emerging, it's possible to generate improved forecasts. Um, because if we were using a single subepidemic, what you would expect to observe is a declining, quickly, quick decline right after uh, the last calibration point. If we do that with a single subepidemic. But by accounting for this subepidemic um, concept, we can do much better and capture better the slower decline of the epidemics as well. And this is just a table showing you know, performance metrics across different um, models. The Richards model is, is basically um, one single subepidemic, and the logistic model is the simplest uh, logistic growth model with two parameters. Obviously, that's the one that performs uh, the worst. Now, let me show you how we have been using uh, these models and some of the new models that we have been developing in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have been generating these forecasts since the very early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. And over the course of 2020 and today, we have been uh, adapting these tools, making some improvements. We have learning, we've been learning a lot about um, what works, what that doesn't work, how to deal with the noise in the data, which is, a, which is an issue. And so let me show you some of the results that we have been obtaining. Since this is the first wave of COVID-19 in, in the USA, in the entire country. And what you see here is that very early on, the subepidemic wave model is predicting a single subepidemic and is you know, under predicting the course. But once you get up there, the model tends to ca uh, capture the fact, it gets enough information to understand that there's more than one subepidemic in the trajectory. And that's where when you start to see that's multiple colors. And it's nice to see how the model is able to capture this slow uh, decline or even this type of um, stationary um, waves of transmission. And not surprisingly, the subepidemic wave model is able to perform much better than the Richards model. This is another example. This is for Spain, where the subepidemic model predicts these multiple subepidemics. And in fact, it predicts this third subepidemic, although the number of cases were declining here, right? If we had just used this blue curve, you would have predicted a very fast decline. But by using all of this data, we predicted this third uh, blip, you want to call it, or search, research, search in, in cases, it actually materialized. Uh, after this decline, there was another increase uh, in, in, in the trend. It's not, very, it's not clear what is driving this, but it's interesting to see that the model is capturing this sort of fractal property in, in, the, in the epidemic trajectory. Uh, this is the fit of the data to Spain for the entire first wave. You can see the model does a nice does job of feeding the model, of feeding the data. The model and the parameters are very well constrained. Now, more recently, we have been generalizing some of these subepidemic wave models because uh, so far, what I have shown you are waves that, um, you know, waves that uh, start, reach some sort of peak, and then decline or stay stationary but I haven't shown you situations where you have resurgence that is actually higher to the prior subepidemic, right? So overall, we are seeing this dynamic where the wave comes in and then loses a strength over time. Now, if we want to uh, capture um, a second subepidemic that may be worse than the first subepidemic, which has happened in COVID-19, 
then we need to relax some of the parameters. In this particular model, you see the R parameter is fixed, P is fixed, by, but the size of the subepidemics is actually different for each subepidemic. So if you want to fit two subepidemics, you would need to fit, estimate two K values, K1 and K2. And here's an example using simulated data. We have the first subepidemic, and then we have a second subepidemic in blue that is actually overtaking the first um, subepidemic. And that ha has happened in COVID-19. The summers in many countries, including the United States, we saw this type of dynamic. And the nice thing is that the number of parameters doesn't grow too quickly. It's just growing as two plus n, right? n is in the number of subepidemics. Uh, in the case where r and p are fixed across all of the subepidemics that you were modeling. Now, if you want to relax further, we could further relax the parameters and say that the growth rate and the scaling of growth could be different across subepidemics. In that situation, the number of parameters will quickly grow. And so it, it is only feasible really to fit a model with two subepidemics, because once you fit three subepidemics with that property, you need to estimate up to you know, 10, 12 parameters. And then the parameters are not really well identified from, from the data in most situations. So this is a, still a good model that can be uh, handled. Um, this is the same simulated data, just to show you how you know, the model fit is with the prediction interval. And now let's use this subepidemic model that is a little bit more flexible to capture or forecast the summer resurgence of COVID-19 in the United States, where you can see, you know, uh, we are capturing from March 21st all the way to uh, June, uh, I think it's June 8th. Yeah, June 18th. And then we don't capture this for this uh, re summer resurgence yet, right? Basically, we are up to this point, the model is saying you just need one subepidemic, things should continue this um, in the same with the same course. But the next day, this is June 19th, and adding one more data point, we already start to see that there's a second subepidemic and uh, the, the level of disease is starting to grow, right? One more day later, we are able to capture much better the resurgence. The, most of the data points are contained within the 95% prediction interval. And this is for June 20, uh, yes, June 21st and June 22nd, June 23rd, right? And this is the same graph as the previous one, but I'm showing you the profiles of the subepidemics for the two subepidemics here, right? At the beginning, we still had here two subepidemics. The first one in, in red, right, is actually going down, declining, and there's something that is growing here but it's suggesting that it will be on an endemic level. The next day we see that actually the growth rates is a little higher and, and so forth. So uh, I, I think uh, I, ha I haven't seen uh, uh, many models out there trying to connect the dynamics in the summer resurgence with the prior dynamics. And I think that's a very substantial um, challenge. And you can imagine that, you know, uh, the second subepidemic could be related to a new variant, right? Which happened in the UK. We're looking at the, uh, the epidemic in the UK. And by doing this, you can disentangle those two processes. And then we can really truly estimate the reproduction number associated with the blue curve associated with the resurgence, which could be a new variant, and separate that from the aggregate epidemic. Uh, here, here are a few more of the forecasts that we have been conducting. Um, more recently, this is December 1st in the US. This is January 1st, I'm sorry. 
this is um, yeah January January first. This is February third, and now we are on a declining leveling off phase that uh, is concerning because you know there may be uh, an indication that there is a, the next resurgence. So we are looking into whether we are able to forecast such a resurgence uh, in almost real time. And this is one of the most recent forecasts. Oh, I didn't plot the data, but actually the, the forecast is pretty, pretty good. And this is the most recent forecast that we generated uh, two days ago, where you can see without showing you the profiles that the first subepidemic is pretty much a, this part here. And then the next subepidemic is this part here. Let me show you the subepidemic profile. And this is just, uh, yeah, with two subepidemics estimating a total of four, four parameters. So we are doing this uh, in, in real time, and we are going to be, you know, assessing how well uh, this framework is able to forecast uh, whether the next resurgence, if it happens. And it, uh, this is pretty much it about this uh, particular work. Uh, more recently, we have been looking at um, using functional data analysis to characterize the heterogeneity in transmission across the US uh, in order to boost the performance of this epidemic model. So if we are able to identify some regions in the US that are behaving differently, that have geographical distinction, which is actually the case, we can do the ensembles across these uh, three or four regions and then join them together into one single ensemble. And that appears to improve our ability to, to uh, forecast the epidemic. I think I have like five minutes. I, I could continue. No, uh, Gerardo, I questions. Gerardo, you don't have five minutes. You already uh, use your time. Oh, OK. Yeah. More this than your time, now? actually, much more. And so there are five minutes for question now. OK, great. Uh, because uh, otherwise, there will be no question. Yeah. That's, that's, and, that's uh, good. <laughs> I understand. That's so great. we have a question from uh, Jacques. So Jacques. Uh, uh, you can uh, you can talk to activate my micro are you yes. hearing me we hear you okay uh hello the, the talks were very interesting and uh, in fact in the <coughs> overlapping sub epidemics are you able to identify sub population and characterize uh, uh, demographically or spatially or, or with comorbidities, could, could, could you, mm. in some cases, identify this subpopulation responsible of this <coughs> overlapped uh, subepidemics? Not really, not yet. Uh, nothing obvious <laughs> to the eye based on you know age or spatial uh, spatial areas. Um, based on the you know the model structure what we identify as subepidemics are not obviously connected to some characteristics as you said you know the demographic sociodemographic factors obviously that would be a very interesting thing to do to be able to connect this to mechanistic frameworks yes. um, but um, up to up to now I think most of the a structure that we are seeing in the in the in the epidemic trajectory is also influenced by stochasticity. Sure. Yes. Right. But have you the, the feeling that uh, at the end of a of a subepidemic, you have finally uh, solved the problem in a in some community, for example, in the Ebola. In each uh, wave was probably corresponding to a, a classical uh, epidemic in a region of uh, Congo or not. Is, is it true or not? For Ebola? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, I think we can comment on Ebola, but I, yes. <laughs> For Ebola, one subepidemic, one subepidemic works at the administrative level. Okay. Most of the time when we okay. saw you know the the, the okay. outbreaks in particular areas yes. in Liberia. 
they were one super epidemic and then okay. controlled. Oh, yeah. uh, there was no resurgence right away. The resurgence occurred later, maybe when people relax a little bit their behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I think it's 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 all about how the how easily the 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 pathogen spreads in the population, right? Ebola is not transmitted through the air, mm -hmm. so that's a major limitation for the virus to be able to spread. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, compared to COVID nineteen, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. um, the the virus can spread the, mm -hmm. pretty much any, anywhere, and and you have this very large fraction of asymptomatic individuals. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, maybe in the next section I can give it at some point later. It's it's also in ensembles, but um, this is um, something on some work that we did uh, recently with my colleague at Georgia State, uh, Regent Luo. It's more on the statistics side of things. But thank you very much. Uh, okay, so um, I, I see you said that you need to go at. Uh, I will need to. I will need to right, go right now, right, minutes. or something I, like that. That's what you said, right? That's so correct. Otherwise, I get one more question, uh, a little bit. Uh, so you did not mention when you started with this multiple wave story. I would like to know this paper. In fact, when you started with this idea. Oh uh, yeah, that's that's something we published in 2019 in in BMC Medicine. Yeah. 2019. Because, yeah, just uh, I had this similar idea to you, actually, oh, cool. uh, earlier than that uh, joint paper with Glenn Webb. I think he's here now. Uh, I know he left, maybe. And no, but uh, uh, working on the SARS, in, in fact. And so uh, the example you show, the data you show also, in fact. Uh, so I would like to see your. Your, if it, you can send me the reference for you. Oh, yeah. Multiple ways. Because when I presented that a few years back, actually, uh, people were not ready to, to receive that, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I should have seen that. Uh, please send me your reference. I'll send you sure, mine. Sure, sure, sure. And we should sure, share this sure, and maybe sure. join And the, the second question is before you leave, if you get a little time, is um, about the. Um, the, why do you choose this kind of uh, logistic model? Because do you have an explicit formula? I don't think so, right? Uh, so no, that? not and for actually the, when right. putting the putting the power of p on this. That's what we are doing now. Exactly. Right? And right. so putting the power of p on the other one, you get an explicit formula for the solution. Mm -hmm. So is there and and actually it's a classical Bernoulli Bernoulli model now. And Bernoulli uh, virus model. So, is there any specific reason why you cho oh, yeah. chose to uh, put you the can fit P better? There? Right, the P with the yeah. P gives you a lot more flexibility to fit the data. That's that's the, it, the isn't reason. It's the same thing to to put the P on the. It's, it, I feel like it's the same thing, but it's a question. I don't understand very well this problem. Huh? I'm just asking the question now is it, to see if there is a. A real, uh, a real uh, improvement by putting the P on the where you put it here. Yes, so, this P here, right in the C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. It's, it's basically we are bringing that from the the fact that the early growth of epidemics is not necessarily exponential all the time, but you can see something that yeah. grows more slowly. But you're right. If you remove the P, you can have a closed form solutions. Yeah. But I mean, oh, you, can another... have a P, you can have a P on the C of a K. This C of a K, of a K can be power P, and then you will have the same kind of behavior than what you got now. Oh, in this section, that, in that's the second. What, that's, what, that's what we are doing, in fact. Right? Oh, OK. So I was going to mention that. So you're doing Richards. <laughs> you got the Richards building block. Uh, it's Bernoulli virus, the original Bernoulli, you know, the first paper uh, on epidemic model, in fact. So oh, okay, okay. he already invented that 20, 200 years ago, <laughs> something yeah. like that. So where, where do you put the P? Well, we can discuss later, but where C do you put over K, C over K power P. It works fine. 
in this second sec in this part. Yeah, 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 yeah. See? That, that's a Richards model. Well, that's Bernoulli Verhulst. <laughs> okay, well, different names, <laughs> different names of the same thing. But okay. They are much earlier, I think. Much earlier. Richard is uh, just in the 60s, right? I'm talking about some guys who yeah, from did that yeah. 200 years ago, right? <laughs> Please send me send me that. Uh, it's yeah. a famous one, you know, in epidemiology, the first paper. On, oh on, yeah, yeah, okay. But in this see. in this form, I, I need to see it. Uh, to yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, so, we should have a we should have a follow up meeting. It looks yeah, like we I can think, work I, on I something. So I think so. I think so. Okay, great. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Pierre. Great talk. Great talk. Can we welcome. switch to the? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we switch to the question of the first speaker now? Because uh, I think uh, it's very frustrating to have no question after that. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, you you don't have uh, many people left already. They are not patient. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to 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 interrupt, but. Uh, it's fine. Yeah, sorry. It's just a matter fault. of uh, being uh, fair with everybody. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, all about that. So, um, so your point. Can I ask maybe a first question? Uh, so your point in your talk is really about the fact that the, the people in Wuhan was not allowed to move after January twenty the third, right? That's what yes. you are saying. There were. They were locked down in Wuhan, and and therefore, the, this introduced a huge bias in the, in the in the in the movement in the the fact that you model the the, the movement of people. That's what you are saying. Yes, well, that's the main I, message of uh, what you are talking. About. I said that's the the main message that I managed to cover. So for right, estimating right, right. epidemic growth, that was very important, and sort of. In the very end of my presentation, I sort of showed you why ignoring that uh, travel ban can lead to huge bias in estimating the, the growth rate. But also uh, something I have hinted, but I didn't manage to get to is when you're estimating the incubation period, um, that, that uh, growth rate actually plays a very important role. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I saw with a lot of the studies on incubation period was they they obtained some data where they for each person there's a period of exposure and then um, later on uh, they observe when the person um, had 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 symptoms. Uh, but the crucial I think the crucial mistake that people make is they assume the time that they got infected is uniformly distributed on the I mean, during that exposure period. That is not true if the epidemic is fast growing. Right, so right. There, uh, there is a figure that um, I was going to show, but I couldn't, uh, but you can see it in, in the paper that shows how large of a bias that can uh, make. So that is also- uh, you, you are talking about the exposed time now, right? Yes. So you are, you are you you are in, in you you can see really the influence of the exposed time. On, yes, on, the, 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 I mean the so you are claiming that you can estimate the exposed time or. Yeah, the time of infection. So the exposed time ah, no, usually no, is no, a period, the, right? Not so the, the time of infection. Exposure I'm not claiming, time the exposed. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not claiming that I can estimate that. My point is the distribution of the time of infection is not usually uniform across mm -hmm. that period. I mean, for like a disease that's not really growing very fast, for example, influenza, maybe that is a reasonable assumption. Mm -hmm. But for COVID-19 in the very uh -huh. beginning, that is definitely not correct. Yeah. Uh, by the way, just to, uh, sorry, I'm, yeah, maybe I should, uh... But just uh, something to mention, uh, I think something like 8 million people left Wuhan, right? Before the 20th, 20, 20, no? 
something like that, right? Not quite is 8 it, million. Is it like true? Is it five, true? 5, 6 million. Yes, that's true. Uh, yeah, so it's a huge proportion of the population yes. of Wuhan, right? Yes. Uh, it's so, about uh, 30 percent, I think. Right. So, I mean, it's really, uh, no, it's that, that's interesting because it's a partial phenomenon, right? This uh, travel ban story. So no, the, to... I mean, that's not, the, the travel ban is not the reason why people left. I know, I know, I know, yeah. but uh, uh, probably they, they were traveling because of the spring festival, right? Yeah, but yes, but certainly this is very, very lucky for the virus um that it uh, right. started in that period right, right, right extremely right. lucky yes yeah right right but also probably some people were trying to get away from Wuhan at that time is it was it known that, already that, that or? happened i think maybe in the last couple of days because oh, i think true. uh it was not officially recognized that the that's virus true. can be transmitted between humans before uh -huh. January 20. I see. And two, three days later, they. So it's, it should be independent, out. should be independent, right? Almost, yeah, I would, uh, yeah, I would yeah, say. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. But many guys probably were infected and traveled around, right? Due to the Spring Festival. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. If it, I think if it happened in a different time, like after the spring festival, maybe it might not even grow into a pandemic. Right. Yeah, once it got out of China, because China, I think the government has a lot of resources to really uh, try to put down the epidemic outbreak, but that's yeah, not yeah. true everywhere else. So once it started uh, community transmission in other places, then it's unstoppable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe, do we have a, one last question? I'm sorry I interrupted you, uh, really. No, it's uh, fine, it's fine, yeah. Uh, it's too my, bad because I think, uh, <laughs> no, so. Quentin, do you have any question? Any well, uh, yes, actually, I, I wanted to uh, to know if, if you, well, uh, if you account for a, a possibility of asymptomatic transmission because it's a feature of, uh, of COVID-19 and, uh, yeah, for the model we considered, it's not a, it's not too important. Um, as I as I've shown uh, in the talk, uh, in that simple model we considered, um, the rate of asymptomatic cases is, I mean that's just a nuisance parameter and it doesn't occur in the likelihood. So, so uh, however, you, I, you need to estimate the the. the probability of uh, contact with some infect infectious individuals? Well, we didn't uh, model that model in that much of detail. We just said the, the probability of infection was growing with time exponentially. Oh, okay. So, so, yeah. so, so, so much, okay. yeah, we didn't have that much. Uh, it's, it's not like a compartmental model where you break people into different mm. groups and you assume different models. We, our model was a much simpler model. It was, in terms of the epidemic, it was just simply you're getting exponentially more likely to be infected. But, okay. there's a, but in the very beginning of the epidemic, you don't have that many cases and it's not quite accurately described by a transmission model. What's more important is, I think, when you don't have that much data, what's more important is to look at every data point you have and use all the information you obtain. Mm -hmm. So I think when people fit these compartmental models, they just look at, usually my understanding is they look at these epidemic curves that shows maybe the symptom onset or the, the confirmed cases by every day. And they try to fit some kind of compartmental model to that curve. But well, actually, actually, that's not possible. But <laughs> oh, okay. that's that's one of the things we uh, we know now. Uh, okay. So you cannot estimate this parameter from just look, by just looking at the at the curve of uh, the, the global growth of cases. Uh, you you have to well use a, static, a statistical method. Uh, this is necessary. 
you, you cannot just use the, the cumulative number of, uh, of cases. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, but what, what I mean is there, there's a lot of information actually in those case reports. Mm -hmm. like, yes, yes. You, like when the people are exposed, when do they travel, what happened to these people? Mm. Oh, you that's mean, actually oh, quite yeah. important. And that's not used, in, I mean, as far as I can see, that's not very much used in, mm. in these methods. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, okay. So okay. So that, that that answers my question. By the way, <laughs> thank you. So any oh, other I'm... question? Maybe. Uh, no. Okay. So if if not, maybe I think it's time to to close the yeah. seminar. So yeah, yeah. Thank you very thank much. You for, very for, much. Thank for, you very for, much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the invitation. Bye bye. Yeah. Pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.